Support for this program is provided by the men and women of the Louisiana Forestry Association. Through sustainable forestry, LFA members promote the health and productivity of Louisiana's forests for generations to come. The Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation of Jennings is a sponsor of Louisiana the state we're in. The Ziegler Museum is a cultural center for Southwest Louisiana, featuring European and American artists and wildlife dioramas. Additional funding for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Hi everyone, I'm Charlie Winham. And I'm Shauna Sanford. Welcome to this edition of Louisiana, the state we're in. This week we dedicate our show to looking at the direction of K through 12 education here in Louisiana. Since the deadly shootings at Sandy Hook Elementary in Newtown, Connecticut, what steps are in place to make Louisiana schools safe? We will also review the several lawsuits challenging education reform efforts by the Jindal administration and the state legislature. First, we are joined by Superintendent of Education John White, and we will also talk with leaders of two teachers' unions in the second part of our program. Superintendent White, thank you so much for joining us on LPB. I appreciate the chance to be here. Thanks it for having me. It is great to have you here. There. Unfortunately, we have to begin with yeah. the, the sad news of those shootings yeah. in Connecticut. Your reaction to what happened there and how this is affecting schools here in Louisiana? Well, Sean, I don't think that there's anything you could say to even begin to describe the horrific nature of what happened in Connecticut and to try to imagine the pain that the families of those children and those teachers and really that mm -hmm. whole community must be feeling right now. Mm -hmm. and I've heard from educators across the state, from uh, parents and, and from community leaders that it's something that's really touched them very deeply. And uh, they're saying that uh, their hearts go out to those folks, but also we want to make sure that that never happens in our school community and mm -hmm. that uh, we want to protect our children, protect our educators, and, and really make sure that uh, schools can be safe havens. Speaking of safe havens, in Connecticut I, there were plenty of uh, different steps and precautions and drills, and they were actually pretty much, a, most people might think, a gold standard. How, how does Louisiana fare? as far as uh, maybe even comparing it to stricter uh, guidelines in, in schools and having drills and such, where does Louisiana face, where they sit in, in this, um, I guess, in a comparative study? Well, you know, over the last week, I've, I've been, the last two weeks, I've been talking to superintendents of school systems, school board members since that event happened, and I've been in community forums and meeting with parents, and, and they've been asking similar questions. Yeah. And, you know, every school is different. We have schools that don't have uh, another school for 25 miles away. We've got other schools that are right next door to another school. We've got some schools that have large outdoor passageways. We've got some schools that are entirely indoors and brick walled. And so every place is different. That's why it's important that local superintendents, the local districts, local school boards, and local principals adopt what our state's laws say, and that they have updated plans for crisis management in place. Those plans typically involve actions by teachers, and teachers need to be well trained on those actions to protect students. They involve security, and they involve a close analysis of where there may be open spaces where students pass and there could be some vulnerability. But as I said, every building is different, every site is different, every community is different. We've got to allow our local managers to have that, pl that plan for their community, but at the same time, we've got to make sure that they are compliant with the requirements of the law. Is this going to call uh, for some sort of reassessment or reevaluation of what is in place? I mean, at the state level with you and with Bessie, is there any sort of conversation that's going to go on as a result of what happened? I, I think there will be a conversation. How could you avoid there being a conversation? Right. I've also talked with a lot of legislators, and they say this is something we want to look at. But I don't think we should rush to judgment about, well, we've got to immediately change this law or we have to immediately change this regulation. I think we have to have faith that law enforcement at the local level that principals and superintendents at the local level, they're as committed as anyone else to making sure that this kind of tragedy never happens in their community and that they do everything possible to prevent it. We have to help them rise to the standard of the law, which is to protect their kids and their educators. 
It's certainly a conversation that I believe we will see more throughout the, the coming uh, new year and especially even in the legislature. Uh, jumping now to uh, the judicial process, the, the Jindal administration's education efforts uh, uh, that you have pushed forward that have now been challenged in the courts, most recently the uh, um, Baton Rouge, in Baton Rouge State District Court, uh, teacher tenure and salary was addressed and, and uh, um, three sections out of four were deemed constitutional, which included the uh, tenure and salary issues. Your thoughts on, on uh, Judge uh, Michael Caldwell's decision? Well, let's start and just talk about what all of this is for. Because we can talk about politics and we can talk about the legalities and the courts and the legislatures and all those things, but at the end of the day, all of this is about trying to impact a child. It's about trying to say, how can we ensure the child is in the best possible school and has the best possible teacher? We know that those are, at the end of the day, the really the most important questions. And so the legislature provided for a couple of laws this last session, one of which gives parents a choice as to where their child should go to school, one of which tries to allow that school systems and schools can keep their best teachers in the classroom. No matter the financial circumstance, no matter anything else, let's keep and honor our best teachers. Now, for whatever reason, there have been folks, and they tend to be the same groups, the unions, who have taken uh, those ideas through legal technicalities and all kind of contortions to court. And in the case you mentioned, Charlie, the judge came back with what I see as an overwhelming validation of what the governor and the legislature did, which is to say, we've got a law that says we're going to compensate our teachers based on how effective they are in the classroom. We're going to keep our best teachers, no matter whether they're layoffs or not. Uh, we're going to ensure that it's not about the rules and regulations of things like tenure and so on that protect teachers who are not competent for our kids. It's about the child. And so that verdict was an overwhelming affirmation of what it is that the governor and the legislature supported. Well, I think that even your opponents would agree it is about the child, and that's probably where you all would end your agreement there, because uh, what you all um, disagree with, um, you're going at this in two totally different ways. Um, because the teachers' unions uh, say that this is an attack on public uh, education. What's your response to that? You know, I, I, I have to say, Shauna, I'm not sure actually that our opponents do start with the idea that it's about the child. And, okay. and I'm not actually uh, criticizing them for that. Look, the union's job is to make it about the employee. And I think sometimes th that effort to protect the employees gets so political, and I, you know, I know how it is in the legislature, but it gets so political that they take stances that actually I think most teachers disagree with. I actually think most teachers want a choice for children. I actually think most teachers know that there is some difference between the very top teacher and a teacher who's not doing their job, and they want to respect the top teachers who are burning the midnight oil to get it right for our children. So it's not to say that, that we disagree on the idea that public education is good for kids, but I do think that our opponents have actually have lost sight of what the core value here is, which is we should do whatever it takes to get this system right for every single child, no matter where they live. And I'm not actually sure that I accept the idea that our opponents have really followed that principle in this case. What do you make of the lawsuit um, concerning Act 2 and the voucher program? Because what was um, the ruling there was that the funding for the voucher program um, is not constitutional. Well, I think here you have a similar case. You know, look, I was in Covington a couple of nights ago in St. Tammany Parish, and I was at a school and listening to the parents describe what the potential of a lawsuit that would do away with their scholarship for their children to attend this school that they had chosen to go to uh, would mean for their families. These are high school kids on the, really, whose lives are in the brink. I mean, it's a question of college, career, or nowhere. And they made a choice that this is the best place. So what I make of it is that I think it's motivated by political rather than child interest motives. Now, at the same time, uh, we've got to move forward. And whatever the ruling in the Supreme Court is, and I'm very confident that it will be a positive ruling, but if it's not, We've got to make sure we protect those families and we protect those kids. And everything I hear from the legislature and government officials and certainly community leaders is that we will do that. We'll protect those kids no matter what. As you said, we're still waiting uh, for then the appeals process. If the MFP uh, uh, formula to fund uh, school uh, children's, uh, ch uh, public school children's money for private schools is still found unconstitutional, um, is that a serious, how serious is a setback is that for your plans? Well, I mean, any time that someone says 
uh, a funding stream is unconstitutional. That's not a helpful thing to, hmm. to achieving what you set out to achieve. But my sense is that the commitment among leaders in this state to protecting the interests of children is so great that we're going to find a way. We're going to find a way to give these kids choice. Now, let me also say, though, this. There are people who would have you think that protecting those 5,000 kids, and maybe it'll be more next year, but for these purposes, 5,000, who are in the scholarship program, is somehow a slight on the 700,000 who are in public schools. Mm -hmm. I, I just, that doesn't strike me as logical. How can we say that because you believe that one family who is by and large low income, hasn't been served well in the public system, and chooses to send their children elsewhere, is somehow contradictory to the being served, served well in the traditional public school system. I refuse to accept that as a dichotomy. I refuse to accept that those things conflict. I think if you're rooting for all kids, you're rooting for public education, you're rooting for charter school public education, and you're rooting for private education, you're rooting for all 800,000 Louisiana kids. And anyone who tries to divide us, I think you have to say has political motives. It's about all kids not about governance structures and politics. Well, what do you say to those people who say it really is about all kids? And right now, the opportunity for those kids, the majority of kids who are in failing schools, it's not there, just because the capacity is not there for those kids to move to other schools that are doing well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, do I say that the system, whether it's public, charter public, or private, is doing right by every child in a failing school? No. But that's not the failing of one program or of one government agency or one school district, that's our failing as a society and as a state. We've got 225,000 kids who are not reading and doing math on grade level in this state. Mm -hmm. That's not one parish's fault or one school's fault. That's all of our responsibility. And so we should do whatever is necessary to protect the interests of those kids. If it's a private school, fine. That's true in 5,000 kids' case this year, maybe more. If it's the recovery school district in Baton Rouge and New Orleans, uh, turning around schools that were low performing like we've seen in New Orleans with those extraordinary successes, great. If it's a school district, a traditional district, saying we're going to place our best principal and turn that, school, th turn that low performing school around, great. For me, it doesn't matter at the end of the day what governance structure or government agency or whatever is overseeing it. It matters whether it's working for the family and the child. And anyone who wants to get in the way of something that that family is saying, this is going to work for my child, I just have to question that. Why would you do that when you know that these parents who know and love that child have said this is what's right for that child? Where do you see the next few months going uh, for, for not only the judici judicial side of things, um, next legislative session? Are there still elements that, uh, uh, that need to be addressed and will be pushed forward through your um, situation and, and your organization? I think where you know the legislature is always going to look for ways to make things better, and uh, in this session, I'm sure that there will be legislators on multiple sides of multiple issues who will be saying we want to see additional changes in education, or we want to see specific uh, changes made in this area or that. I do think what's important is we protect the extraordinary gains that we've made. We're on the start of a very long journey, and you know another thing that people would have you think is this is a 2012, 2013 mm -hmm. issue. No. This is a generational issue. Mm -hmm. We're raising standards for our kids. We're raising standards for our educators. We're providing choices for families in a way that we've never done before. That's a once in a generation shift and we're at the start. Let's give it some time and it'll over time work out very, very well for our state. In about 30 seconds, I know you have something that you want to let us know about teacher evaluations. That, mm. That's going to be a little bit of a, of a change. And we're running short on time, yeah, so I'm going to yeah, have yeah. to ask, ask mm -hmm. you to make it brief. Well, I think in a couple of weeks we're going to be talking in public about uh, what we're, how we're making our teacher evaluation system into a real professional development tool. I think that's one way that I hope all of us can get around the table, opponents and proponents alike, and work together to make this tool compass work for our educators. We've got to root for our public school educators. We've got to help to make them better. We've got to support them if we're going to lift all tides. All right. Superintendent White, thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much. Great having you here. Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you. Same to you. <laughs> LPB is a part of a, a group of public television and radio stations across the country that are partners in education reporting, and it is called the Southern Education Desk. That's right. The Southern Ed Desk is a partnership among media outlets across the Gulf South. We delve into a wide range of educational issues from kindergarten through 12th grade and higher ed. For more information, you can log on to southerneddesk.org. Now there, you can see how other states are handling numerous educational issues and topics. You will also be able to watch our interview
interview with the education uh, superintendent, John White, as well as our next interview with the leaders of the state's top teachers unions. It's been a very busy few months as the court systems have been hearing challenges of Louisiana's education reform laws pushed by Governor Jindal and the state legislature. School safety is also at the forefront following the deadly shootings at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Connecticut. Joining us now are Steve Monahan of the Louisiana Federation of Teachers and School Employees and also Joyce Haynes, who is president of the Louisiana Association of Educators. Thank you both so much for being here. We greatly, greatly appreciate your time. Thank you for the invitation. Yes, you're welcome. Well, let's begin with, with the safety issues, with the terrible shootings out in uh, Connecticut, uh, and how it translates to Louisiana schools. Uh, I'll throw that, this question out to you both. How safe are K through 12 schools throughout Louisiana? And the, and the school in Connecticut was, was very state safe and had plenty of, of different drills uh, of all sorts, including firearms coming to their schools. Well, we know that they all have safe school plans, uh, their codes, and uh, of, I believe that they've even changed several of the codes to the actual words, uh, whether there's an intruder or whatever the case may be, a reason to evacuate. Uh, you know, so we also have the natural uh, elements that happen, like tornadoes and uh, mm -hmm. our hurricanes. And so they all have plans. Uh, uh, it is just so important they have um, directions for you to uh, uh, put your name into the office and, and make sure someone knows that you have a badge and a reason to be there. Mm -hmm. And if someone sees something, it, it's an immediate hit the intercom and say, intrude on campus, it's a lockdown. Yeah. Um, and I, I think they do the best that they can. And we're so proud, our, heart, our hearts bleed for the folks in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we do understand that uh, the gun problem is going to be something that they will have to deal all the way to the top with. Right. And so we're, right. we're but, very it, but is interested. it enough? There's a lot that's in place, but is it enough? When you look at what happened to this school, this guy shot his way into the school system. Is it enough what's in place? It's not, no, it's, it's not enough. And I think uh, the reason why we have a, a School Safety Act in Louisiana was it was passed in 2001. Uh, and it was in response to the, the other tragedy that occurred with, with uh, 911, mm -hmm. and everyone then talks about plans. Now, when that bill was filed and it w was in its original state, it was much more, uh, had much more teeth in it about doing something, and then it, it was pretty much reduced to the planning aspect. There's no one solution in solving the problem, because it's not a school problem, it's a societal problem, and we all know that. Uh, it's a mental health problem, it's a gun problem. Mm -hmm. But I think when we hear people talk about all things on the table, some things can't be on the table. It doesn't mean more guns equal more safety in this case. Uh, we don't want our schools to be prisons, but I will say this, much more can be done and priorities set. We should assess every building to see what the state of that building is in protecting children. Do we have doors that can adequately stop an intruder from coming in if we have to go into lockdown? What we learned in Connecticut is we didn't. Mm -hmm. He shot his way through a glass entry portal and they went about uh, the business of, of killing, the sad, tragic business that occurred. Imagine if we would have done, in, in the case of school safety, what we did on airplanes immediately after 911. We retrofitted doors on those airplanes so that we would slow someone down, for God's sake, at least to get in. We have doors in, in, in many of Louisiana schools that are falling down and can't be locked. We have doors that shouldn't be particle wood, but they should be, they can be aesthetically pleasing and still protect children. But I want to stop you right there because that sounds really great, but there are a lot of nervous moms and dads out there who want something done right now. And there are a lot of people, a lot of states that are talking about arming teachers and school personnel. There's even a case right now where there's a, a father who is a Marine who is standing guard at his child's school because he just doesn't know what to do and parents want to protect. So the immediacy of this, what do we do in the meantime? Because that's great, but, but for parents looking for an immediate answer. I believe that schools should be the haven that we want them to be for our children and everything is important. It's important that communities take part. You have here in Baton Rouge um, uh, security dads, mm -hmm. uh, those folks who take, when they're off from work, uh, are on those campuses, they know the children, uh, they have walkie-talkies and they can inform the office of anything that they see different, mm -hmm. but mostly that the, they, the children know that they are the fathers, they're parents of students at that school, and a lot of them may have children that are gone now, but they, they are still there and they're about the business of making sure our children have a safe place. And that's what, the, that's what it's all about. These fathers will walk ladies to their cars at night after a game, or they will be on that campus and patrolling, and they know every aspect of where to look, where to be, 
And, uh, so it's going to have to be community it's, generated, it's, it's, you think? As well. It, it, it takes all of us. It takes mm -hmm. a village. Uh, and, I, and I think the short-term solution is, is not going to be the answer. Everyone's going to react knee-jerk to the situation because, of course, every parent, I'm a parent, I, I want my child to be safe. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, and but I think what we have to do is measure that to mean that doesn't mean your child is going to be safe because we do have a father that's standing there with a gun. The father could be shot down with another gun. Right. So to answer the question, I think we have to be looking at social policies in, in, in respect to mental health issues that are very, very important. Mm -hmm. We're cutting mental health and we've never had mental, adequate men, mental health in Louisiana. We've been lucky and fortunate. Don't cut counselors in schools right now. Yeah. And that's a big them. problem. There are not enough counselors in schools. In the meantime, it's us. And until something is done about gun laws and the changes that need to happen there, we as uh, community leaders, business, whomever, need to help take part in making a great public school for every child. And it also means resources. We need to look at the resources and making sure that all of the things that we're talking about um, are there and in place. Well, I'd also like to say uh, we have other issues, too, uh, to talk about because of uh, uh, the court cases that have uh, been going on regarding uh, the legislature and the Governor Jindal's administration's reform efforts in education. Uh, just this week, uh, Act 1 was being decided in the Baton Rouge uh, State District Courthouse and Michael Caldwell presided. Uh, three of the four sections uh, regarding teacher tenure and salary, they were uh, considered, uh, they were uh, deemed constitutional. Mm -hmm. uh, one that was not that we'll get into details, but your thoughts regarding uh, the decision in, uh, in the st district court recently? Look, that's crazy. <laughs> well, uh, we start with Act 1 and basically Judge Caldwell, yeah. uh, you know, as we said at immediately after he rendered his decision, he had a very difficult decision uh, to make and he essentially uh, played Solomon. He split the baby. Uh, the, the bill, and it wasn't the judge's problem, it wasn't uh, Judge Kelly's problem one too. The problem is, is when haste is employed to, for, legis for legislative initiatives in disregard for the Constitution as the process begins, and that's what happened on March 12th, this is where we end up. We end up in court. Now, I, I find most unfortunate is that, and, I, and I'm going to end it with this, what marks this whole conversation was the heightening of rhetoric that began in, in January of last year. Uh, where there were polarized positions taken, and I put this on the, the governor's table, of, of basically vilifying anyone who disagrees and then challenging the resistance to remain quiet. Well, that's impossible. We have to challenge those things as Americans, as, as vanguards of freedom. When we see the law being violated, the Constitution being violated, we find ourselves in court. I would hope that the rhetoric would simmer and that cooler heads would prevail and we look for solutions that are not in the classroom. I mean, not in the, uh, in the courtroom, but actually in the legislative uh, arena where this began. But where do we go from here? Because we could see more lawsuits as a result oh, of we this. We are going to see more lawsuits. Mm -hmm. What we believe is that the attack on public education is real, and it starts with ALEC, the uh, American uh, Legislative Exchange Council. They are rewriting these laws and they are placing them in the states so that they can destroy public education and allow it to be privatized. Sell our schools to the highest bidder for a profit and leave no benefits with the folks who are working there. And you even know here in this state they have passed a law that says you don't have to be certified to teach in our charter schools. Uh, we have six type charter schools here. That is a problem. Uh, the takeover kind have not been successful and that would be the recovery school district that's moving out of New Orleans and into um, the state. And one other thing, the voucher system itself does not help you achieve or do anything for our children. What it does is cipher off money, the monies and the resources that are needed to make all of our uh, public schools great and it goes back to using standardized tests incorrectly to say that we're all failing. And that brings us to the other court case that the decision from another district court, Judge uh, Timothy Kelly in Baton Rouge last month, uh, found that unconstitutional to use MFP dollars, mm -hmm. the minimum foundation program dollars that is uh, put together by the legislature per pupil. That's the unconstitutional element. They did not say it's unconstitutional or help me out. Uh, that it could be used, found other dollars. So what were your thoughts? Uh, is that a, 
was that a victory for for your, uh, is that the it victory you're goes, looking for it goes back to the very beginning of the of the conversation the governor had a voucher program on the books since 2008 in, in New Orleans. uh it was piloted for 3 years prior to going as he said bold and deep and attempting to use mfp funds in violation to the constitution so the there was never a legal quarrel about the issue of the voucher program now mm -hmm. policy issues are different and what i find remarkable in the whole discussion is that we had a program being piloted for three years in New Orleans, but during the evidentiary fr phase of the arguments, during the, the brief arguments in the legislative session passed, there was never evidence brought forward by the proponents that it was successful in New Orleans. Uh, usually, that's the first thing you do in a legislative discussion. You, at, you provide the evidence that the program that you wish to expand statewide and now fund through a, a vehicle that you shouldn't be using in the first place, that you can actually demonstrate to the public that it was working. It also it tells you something when 98% of our folks did not even apply for that voucher or scholarship as they call it, uh, simply because they understand it is taking away those resources. Whenever you stop to look at the full picture or if you look anywhere in any history of vouchers, uh, the public has always voted against that. They understand that those public dollars were there for public education and to make sure that every one of our children had a free and safe public education in we're our have, system. We're going to have to let that be the last word. Thank you both so very Thank much you. for being with us. Appreciate your time and want to have you back. Anytime. Okay. Happy holidays. Happy Thank holidays. You. Thank okay. you. And that is our show for this week. Remember, you can watch any of our stories and interviews again at your convenience online at lpb.org. And for those of you who communicate on social media, make sure and check us out on Facebook. That's right. Our Facebook page is a great way to stay in touch with LPB programmers and producers. We have topped 5,500 friends and we are looking for you to join the conversation as well. Now here you can stay up to date with LPB activities and shows as well as share your thoughts on what matters to you. Just hit the like button on your Facebook on our Facebook page to join the conversation. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, thanks for watching. Until next week, that's the state we're in. We'd like to hear from you. Write Louisiana the state we're in, 7733 Perkins Road in Baton Rouge. Call toll-free 1-800-272-8161 or email LPB. And visit our website at lpb.org to view your favorite stories again. This and other editions are available on home video. Support for this program is provided by the men and women of the Louisiana Forestry Association. Through sustainable forestry, LFA members promote the health and productivity of Louisiana's forests for generations to come. The Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation of Jennings is a sponsor of Louisiana the state we're in. The Ziegler Museum is a cultural center for Southwest Louisiana, featuring European and American artists and wildlife dioramas. Additional funding for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting.